Well, welcome everybody. Um, this meeting is going to be recorded and posted to the OATS website and the YouTube channel for the benefit of those who could not attend live today. Um, and uh, welcome to the Organic Advisor Call Series. I'm your facilitator, Nate Powell Palm, and this series is brought to you by the Organic Agronomy Training Service. This is our 10th episode. So please visit the OATS website uh, to see this call schedule in the list of topics that we've covered and we will cover. Um, if you haven't done so already, I highly recommend signing up for the newly launched Organic Advisor Listserv. We'll be having some great conversations right in your inbox on all things organic and related to advising organic farmers. The link to sign up is going to be in the chat. Um, we're going to have an exciting uh mini programming that we're going to be covering over the next few months. And I'm really excited to introduce my guest, Megan Vaith, um, to talk a little bit about it. So a little on Megan. Megan is the owner of Northbourne Organic Crop Insurance, LLC, and Northbourne helps farmers seeking expert advice in private and supplemental insurance products for transitional organic and conventional crops while also advocating the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service to enhance protections for organic and specialty crop producers across the country. So welcome, Megan, and really appreciate you joining us today. Um, a little bit about, so we don't leave folks hanging, let's talk about all of the things related to crop insurance that you're working on uh, with OATS on. So do you, do you tell a little bit about the programming and what folks can see as far as tools in their toolbox in the coming months? Yes, absolutely. Well, thanks, Nate, for the lovely introduction. Um, we have a lot of really good things happening right now in oats for crop insurance, specifically for organic farmers. We kind of took a look at the market and realized there wasn't a whole lot of information out there for organic farmers or organic advisors as to what's allowed in crop insurance and what isn't. So we wanted to try to solve the problem by creating an entire series of information for farmers. So this call series is part of that. Um, and then we are developing a video-based educational software for organic advisors to learn more about it and ins and outs and what's available and what's not. Then we have a podcast series we're also working on and a few webinars coming up as well. And this is brand new, hot off the press information. We will be doing webinars on, I'm pulling up my calendar here, uh, March 6th and March 10th. So the press releases on those will come out later. They will be region specific. So we are going to tailor some of the topics to that specific region. So that's really exciting to kind of get some good information out that's relevant to farmers and advisors in that area. So we're really excited about all the things that are happening in organic crop insurance with oats. As a farmer, I am excited about all the things that are happening. So we're really excited to your expertise to help us all gain a better understanding. Um, a couple more things real quick. We are hoping to have an iterative conversation. And so everybody who's online now, please uh, throw your questions in the chat for Megan. Um, and if you want, just open your mic and you can catch us at any point um, and, uh, and ask Megan your question. We're hoping to just get kicked off here with a few questions for Megan, but we want to hear from you. So please jump right in. Um, all right, so folks, also stick around at the end and we'll talk a little bit about future call series. So don't go away. We're going to go right to the top of the hour, um, but let's get started. So Megan, could you talk a little bit about your journey into the organic space? I know as a farmer, when I call up a lot of crop insurance agents, they have no idea what organic is other than the rumors they've heard from you know a neighbor's neighbor. So how did you get and then focus on organic crop insurance? Yes, great question. So a few years ago, I was just working as a standard crop insurance agent dealing with mostly conventional corn and soybeans. And I kind of took a look at the industry and realized that organic farmers were not very well represented. It seemed like most agents, including myself, had one or two organic farmers on the books, and they didn't really pay a lot of attention to them because the majority of their focus was on the conventional corn and beans because that's what was deriving their paycheck. So I realized that, and then I kind of took a look deeper into it to, to see like, do these organic farmers have advantages or something that they should be aware of that they're missing out on because I myself am doing them a disservice. And I realized that yes, there are some pretty big advantages and just differences in organic farming versus conventional that um, they should have a specialized agent for them. So I did some market research and realized that there was no organic special crop insurance agent across the US. 
So I took that as a great opportunity to kind of start my own agency and jump into it and create an agency that was specific for the organic farmer, which from there kind of branched out to specialty since a lot of times they're encompassed together so that they had someone to go to to ask questions that would be a knowledgeable resource and maybe someone to help advocate for better coverage specifically on the organic and specialty side um, rather than dealing with mainly just conventional farmers. Um, so that's been a really great journey. It's been a lot of fun to have many different conversations than I was used to in the past. So I get to deal with a lot of different crops, a lot of different um, states, which also means a lot of different time zones. So managing my schedule can be quite a bit more challenging as well. But it's been really fun to kind of get into all that and travel around to different conferences and talk to people. Um, a big part of what I do and what I like to do, I don't really love to sell, I like to educate. And so I do a lot of things like this and give presentations and webinars just to educate farmers and advisors on what organic crop insurance really entails. Um, so that's really kind of the gist of what I do and what I really enjoy doing every day. So when we think about those advantages that you mentioned um, at the beginning, could you talk a little bit about those? When, when you're fresh eyes on the organic industry, what was it that struck you about organic as a value proposition for American agriculture? Yes, the number one thing, and I will probably always say this, is contract pricing. I think this is the very big biggest advantage that organic farmers have when it comes to crop insurance. And so what this is, is crop insurance 101. You figure out your guarantee by taking your approved history. So what your average yields were over the last four to 10 years on your operation and multiply it by the crop insurance price to get um, like your approved revenue and then multiplied by the coverage level to get your guarantee. So crop insurance prices are all derived based on the conventional board of trade price. We are all well aware on this call that organic prices are tracked much differently than organics and conventional. They're just different between the two of them. And so what they do is they take a factor of that conventional price to come up with what they think the organic price is. Uh, so for example, last year on corn and beans, the organic price was 1172 on corn and 2741 on beans. They just took a factor times the conventional price. What contract pricing does is instead of using that set crop insurance price to calculate your guarantee, you can actually use your own individual contracted price that you were able to contract your grain for. So this is really kind of the only way to truly individualize your coverage. And conventional farmers don't get the opportunity to do this, which is why I think it's a huge advantage for organic farmers. So instead of like beans, for example, instead of using 2741 to calculate their guarantee, they're able to plug in their contract, which for last year, price, prices were crazy high. So some farmers were getting contracts up to $38 a bushel. So instead of having 2741, they were getting $38 a bushel. So that's an extra $10 a bushel jump on their guarantee. And then like here in the Midwest, we had a very severe drought this last year. So that made a really, really large difference on producers indemnity checks that they were able to receive at the end of the year through crop insurance. Really helps them keep farming year to year and establish a personalized guarantee rather than just using what the set prices are. So I, I think that I, is far and above the big, biggest advantage for organic farmers. Isn't it just amazing? Contract price addendums have always just blown me away as such a special part of the opportunity to be organic. I think about, you know, when we look at um, the, uh, the, the, as you described, the difference between organic marketing and selling and business structure between organic and conventional and how from the beginning of my farming career, I've always been pro forward contracting, trying to make sure I have a buyer for the crop before I even stick the seed in the ground. And it seems like organic crop insurance options really align with that of trying to make sure we're not just getting into cycles of oversupply where everybody's planting wheat. It's if you do have that contract price, you're going to be able to have much better coverage. So yeah, couldn't agree more. This is, it's an exciting, exciting fact of organic. Um, yeah, someone to dig a little oh, yeah. deeper on that too, just for everybody that's aware that it might apply to them. In order to utilize this, you can't just automatically have it. You have to have a special option called contract pricing, 
on your crop insurance policy by sales closing. Um, so sales closing for all spring crops, which is kind of like the sign up deadline for crop insurance is March 15th. So that's coming up pretty quick here. So you need to have that on your policy by March 15th. And then you have to supply your agent, your like a copy of your contract by acreage reporting deadline, which most often is July 15th for spring crops. And so what I suggest for all organic farmers is put contract pricing on your policy and have it in place in case you wanna use it. If you don't have a contract by July 15th or like for corn example, the price is 1172. If your contract is less than 1172, so you don't wanna use it, you just don't submit it to your agent and you don't get charged any extra premium because you didn't use it. And so it's nice to just have it on your policy, have it there in place in case you wanna use it in the future, just as a safeguard. Absolutely, that's super helpful. And we are coming up on that deadline. I know March 15th is gonna be our first one and then final reporting by July 15th. Um, we have a question in the chat already. Could you describe changes that you would like to see in the 2023 Farm Bill to better support organic regenerative ag and specialty crop farmers? Yes, um, there are a few. Okay. So one of the main things that I've been working on, and I've been working with the Center for Rural Affairs on advocacy for this one, is the final plant date. So I think we're probably all well aware that organic farmers typically plant a little bit later than conventional farmers, just because farming is way different on the organic side than it is for conventional. However, in crop insurance, they all have the same final plant date. And if you plant after that final plant date, you either get penalties on your crop insurance, um, or you're not able to have insurance depending on how far after that final plant date um, you were planting. And so one of the things that we're suggesting is maybe a little bit more leniency for organic farmers on the final plant date, maybe an extra five days without any penalties compared to what the conventional farmer receives. So that's a big one. Um, another one is toga, which is the big thing this year, which is where um, certified organic crops or farmers get an extra $5 per acre premium discount on their crop insurance, and then transitional farmers get an extra 10 percentage points of subsidy on their crop insurance. So it's making their premium quite a bit cheaper than it has been in the past, which is really great for organic farmers. Uh, the, as of right now, it has only been announced for 2023 only. I would love to see this get pushed out as a renewing uh, policy in the future to kind of try to help uh, the organic supply and demand within the U.S. Another thing is the pandemic cover crop program, which I'm sure everybody's heard a little bit about, but what that was, was on acres that you had planted a cover crop to, you could receive a $5 per acre premium discount on your crop insurance as well. Uh, they have discontinued that for 2023, which I thought was a little disappointing because I thought organic farmers would maybe like hit it big a little bit where they could get the $5 per acre discount because they're certified organic and then $5 on the cover crop, but they discontinued it. So I'd like to see that continued as um, like a regenerative organic thing in the future. Another big thing, which is kind of getting into the weeds a little bit, but this is a big topic for me, is enterprise units by organic practice. And so enterprise units is where a farmer has maybe two different sectional lands, sections of land that he plants to the same crop. We'll just say they're both planted to corn. He can average those yields together and get an enterprise unit discount, which has a much higher subsidy rate. So the premium is quite a bit cheaper on that. Why, right now, if you farm both conventional and organic, if you want enterprise units, all of those yields will be gathered together. I don't like the idea of averaging both conventional and organic yields together because much different things can happen on each field when you're dealing with that. So I'd really like to see a change where we allow enterprise units by organic practice, where you could have a separate enterprise unit where you're averaging all of your conventional land together and then a separate one where you can average all your organic land together. So you still qualify for that discount, uh, but you're not averaging the whole operation together. Those are some now of the that, things, which is probably more than that you is. Oh my gosh, that's the reason I'm so excited for a podcast, a video series. This is the stuff that is going to help folks. I'm really excited for this. But speaking to that enterprise unit a little bit, is there some world in which I know a lot of really good conventional producers bulk at going organic because they're going to take a pretty big hit in their tea yields for what their expected yeah. yield is going to be. So if you're a 300 bushel an acre corn grower um, and you feel or you have evidence that you could be 200, 250 organic, um, but the the tea yield is uh, it's sort of 
um, theoretically low. How do we talk about that? How can we how can we talk to those folks about having reasonable risk coverage if they make the leap to go into organic and won't be punished too much by making that leap? Yeah, that's a very great question because the transition to organic can be very hard um, in all aspects and the crop insurance is included in that. So typically when you are just starting out in organics for your guarantee for what they calculated as your proven history, since you don't have any actual organic history, they use 65% of the conventional county teal. So it's very, very, very low. And yeah. we've all seen the research. We know that organic farmers don't raise 65% oftentimes of what the conventional farmer is growing. So we'd love to see that higher. So that's another thing. Talk to your advocacy groups, legislators, try to get that changed. I would love to see that changed as well. So thank you for mentioning that. It is Absolutely. a very tough time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, um, I am fascinated by how um, much uh, bandwidth that, uh, or band both bandwidth and answered authority, um, RMA has to listen and and take data in from the community about developing better and more reactive insurance products. Lots of times, I think we talk about the farm bill and we talk about legislative changes, but the Crop Insurance Act really gives quite a wide latitude to those experts at RMA to hear from the community. So could you speak a little bit about organic is, I think, always talking about how we we do things different and we don't really have insurance products that match that. And it seems like this might be not so much an intention or a um, legislative question, but a data question that we need to figure out how do we get data to RMA that describes what we're doing is good farming practices, is not experimental, and ultimately leads to um, the opportunity to have better insurance products. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and I think that brings up a great point too, is RMA, in my opinion, which is the risk management agency, so they're managing all of crop insurance, has their ears open and willing to listen more now than they probably ever have in the past. They really wanna hear what's going on and try to make crop insurance work for the farmers. And so gathering data, like you said, like I know I've been working on hybrid rye research, mm -hmm. specifically in South Dakota, to try to get an insurable crop for that. They've done all the research to see what yields it can produce compared to your standard, you know, open pollinated rye. And we've been submitting those to RMA and they're looking at expanding that program. Unfortunately, things take a long time because they need a lot of data in order to put out a program. Um, along with that, Written agreements is a big part of organic crop insurance as well. And one thing that I stress quite a bit, which is where if a farmer is trying to plant a crop and they want insurance on that crop and crop insurance isn't available in that county for that crop, a lot of times they are told by agents, the crop is an insurable end of discussion. But that's not always the case. Organic farmers are oftentimes planted crops that are much more specialized and maybe rare to the area than conventional farmers. And so we see a lot of times that crop insurance might not be available for that crop. So what the farmer can do is he can submit a written agreement to the crop insurance company, which is them asking for insurance on those acres where insurance isn't readily available. There's some supporting documentation they need with the main thing is history of either that crop or a similar crop. They need three years of history and there's an established list for similar crops, um, but they can submit that information to try to get insurance on those acres for that specific crop. I stress this quite a bit because when RMA is looking at expanding the crop insurance program to make coverage more widely available for farmers, they're going to look first to see if there's a need. And if they don't have any data, it's not showing that there's a need. So if they don't see any written agreement submitted for that area, for that county, it says, oh, there's not a need for it. Nobody's wanting the insurance. So they're not gonna bother expanding the program. And I don't blame them. That's how I would operate it as well. Uh, so submitting those written agreements, sending RMA all the information we can, can really make a big difference. That's huge. So could you speak a little bit to what some of those specific um, components of a written agreement are as far as what farmers have to have done with um, growing that crop historically and how they should think about, um, you know, if we're looking at 2023 and we want to get insurable products, planting crops now that you might want to grow in the future so you can build up a data set to, to talk to insurance in the future. 
Yes, absolutely. And I should pull up my list so I don't misspeak. But um, and if you want to share that list, thing, uh, I am yeah, I have like happy to give you screen sharing. <laughs> um, but yes, there is a list of similar crops or the crop that you're requesting that you need to have at least three years of history on. Mm -hmm. And let me pull up this for example. So this is one for sunflowers. And I think you're seeing presenter view, I'm yes. assuming. Yes, we are. Perfect, so here we go. So this is for sunflowers, for example. All of the crops on this list are eligible to be proven as a similar crop history. And so if you're wanting to plant sunflowers for the very first time this year, but you have history in corn, soybeans, dry beans, anything on this list, if you have three years of history, you can qualify for an agreement. Or if you have three years of history of sunflowers. So for this one specifically, it seems like oftentimes it's really easy to qualify because a lot of farmers have history in some of these crops. And it doesn't need to be like, I have three years of corn. It can be a mix or match of the different crops available. Gosh, and so that's, that's kind cool. of the main head. Yeah, so I mean, as long as farmers have some sort of history with three years of some any of the crops on this list, they are eligible to be submitting a written agreement to get crop insurance on sunflowers or like if it's dry beans, you just replace the two, whatever it may be in order to have the ability to have some insurance on their land. It's really risky to go an entire year without having crop insurance. And when you look at the numbers, it seems like organic farmers are a really large group of farmers that don't purchase crop insurance. And so one of the big things that we're trying to do with all of these projects that we're working on with oats is try to uncover why it may be. Like, is there a certain reason? Is it lack of education, all of that? And I think that's probably part of it, which is why I've been heav heavily advocating for this and just other topics um, so that they are aware of it, that there is an option to have crop insurance and it's not just an automatic no. Absolutely. And I think this is one of the most exciting components is being self-insured is scary. It is it is unnecessary burden that organic farmers have been carrying for far too long. And uh, and your work and I think the work of oats in this space is going to really move that needle trying to figure out how do we get those folks who want to be in the tent and understand their coverage options. Um, when we look to the coming season, what are some big dates that you'd be thinking of organic farmers and advisors to organic farmers should have on their radar um, as we move into the growing season? Great question. March 15th, it's probably the biggest deadline as far as crop insurance goes. And that is because this is the deadline that derives your coverage for the entire year. And so with that, what farmers are mostly doing between now and March 15th is they're looking at quotes to see what coverage looks like at each different coverage level. So crop insurance coverages are available from 50% all the way up to 85% with different subsidy structures for each coverage level as well. Um, so farmers are oftentimes looking at what coverage levels they might be wanting versus how much guarantee they'll get back and then the premium on it as well. And one thing, if we have any farmers on the line here, one thing I should mention is when you're looking at those quotes this spring, the TOGA discount, the $5 per acre premium discount will not be reflected on that because they're just going to take it off of the billing statement. So keep that in mind when you're looking at these quotes that your premium will most likely be $5 per acre cheaper if you're certified organic, which might allow you to get better coverage and maybe jump up a coverage level and use your dollars that way rather than just saving it in the end. Um, so that is the biggest deadline. And if you are thinking you might have to go the written agreement route or you're working with farmers that Maybe this is the route they need to go to if you're in seed sales and trying to push a new product and think this might fit your farmers, start the conversation early. Written agreements requires an entire packet of information that needs to be submitted to the crop insurance company. And then after that, the crop insurance company will send back an offer for the farmer. And if the offer comes back not in the farmer's favor, he doesn't think it's you know what he needs, he can deny the offer. He doesn't have to take the insurance. So that's the cool thing with written agreements is you can either accept or deny it after the offer comes back. But it does take time. So I suggest starting the conversation early, getting that written agreement packet submitted so that you can try to get your offer back as soon as possible to know where you're sitting for the year. So March 15th is very clearly a very big deadline. I think the main things to drive home here, written agreements, contract pricing, both of those need to be in place by March 15th. 
The next biggest deadline is acreage reporting, which is where farmers just report what acres they planted, when they planted them, and what crop they planted it to. So pretty basic. Most farmers are doing the exact same thing at FSA, so it's just kind of a duplicating the process. Um, and that is July 15th for most spring planted crops. And then after that comes harvest time, production reporting, which is also loss time as well. And so the biggest drive home factor here is if a farmer's harvesting or you're having a conversation with a farmer and they are saying, yeah, the yields aren't looking great, like a little nervous about how things are going, have them be in touch with their crop insurance agent and see if they qualify for a loss. There is a time period where you have to submit a loss within, and if you miss that window, then you won't be eligible for an indemnity payment. So it's very important to keep that conversation going and make sure that you're not missing out on that. You pay for this insurance for a reason. If you qualify for a loss, you might as well use it. Love that. Absolutely. So March 15th, July 15th, reporting when we actually have our harvest and what our yields were. Um, there's a question in the in the chat box of what resources links should we refer organic farmers to um, when it comes to crop insurance. And I think that sort of builds to a bigger question of if everyone can't work directly with you, Megan, and have you be their agent, how do we find and vet folks who actually know this stuff as far as crop insurance? Yeah, is? yeah great question. And I think we could have some better resources for that as well. RMA has an agent locator tool where you can just search like organic and pull up any organic crop insurance agency. However, if you do that, the only one that's going to pull up is mine because I'm the only agency that has organic in the name. Does that mean that I'm the only one that knows crop, organic crop insurance? Absolutely not. There are other agents that are familiar with it. So I think a lot of it is word of mouth. Um, like if you have a neighbor that's organic, ask them who they're working with. Do they think that they know what they're doing? That kind of thing. Or you go to an organic farming conference. Is there any crop insurance agents there? Kind of quiz them a little bit. What's special about organic crop insurance versus the conventional? Um, and maybe just bring up a scenario like, yeah, I wanted to plant this crop. We get into good farming practices all the time. Does this qualify for good farming practices on whether I will qualify for a loss or not? Quiz them a little bit and see where it fits. There are agents that are familiar with organic crop insurance. I really do not want this to be salesy at all. There are definitely more options than just me. I'm just probably the biggest face out there advocating for it would be my take on it. Absolutely, I appreciate that. And your example is exactly how I found my crop insurance agent. Uh, just calling up my neighbor who I knew was doing uh, doing a lot of the similar crops, similar rotations that I was, and just said, who is your uh, your agent? How, do, how does this work? And he just gave me her name and number and we were off to the races. It was really a very seamless product. Um, and, uh, and she knew exactly what I needed to be working with and thinking about um, and, and what coverage levels fit best, what she and her experience has seen work well. So that's a great example. As you are expanding your reach, would you say that there are, uh, that folks could contact you if they don't feel like they can find someone um, in their uh, in their region? Yeah, so that's the really cool thing with crop insurance too, and maybe technology as well, is the only restriction in crop insurance is the agent or agency has to be licensed in that state. So you don't have to live there. And with COVID and everything that farmers got more and more familiar with Zoom and working over the phone and email, that's really kind of expanded the whole market and just changed the way that all of this works. And so absolutely, farmers can reach out to really anybody across the lines. If they hear that they're a good agent, reach out because odds are they're probably already licensed in that state as well. I think um, out of the 48 contiguous states, I am licensed in probably 28 to 30 of them. So it, it's a large chunk. Absolutely. Well, that's super helpful just for a resource to figure out how we get on the path of finding an agent that works with organics and can be a resource. Um, let's talk a little bit about the myths surrounding organic crop insurance. And I think there are many, but I, whenever I uh, go to um, some uh, a convention or a farmer's meeting, oftentimes there's folks who flatly say you can't get crop insurance. Crop insurance doesn't exist for organic. So one of the, in, in Montana and in, um, in a lot of different uh, growing regions, we have intercropping, we have multi-species cropping. How do we manage 
um, all of these practices and put them into formats and communications with our agents that um, that don't violate the the respective um, good farming practices, but that embrace the nuanced and diverse cropping systems that we have in organic. Yeah, great question. Um, and maybe a frustrating one with it, because I think this is a very common topic that gets brought up all of the time. Um, and so it's, it, it's a little bit complicated too, because it's situation by situation. And so there's an entire branch of good farming practices that farmers are supposed to follow. And during an adjustment process, when an adjuster comes out and looks at the acres and everything to see if you qualify for a loss, if they don't deem that you're following good farming practices, there's potential that they could deny a claim. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, like when you read the handbook, there is a caveat in there that organic farmers, as long as they're following their organic systems plan, they qualify for good farming practices. So in, in the past, there's been this myth that, you know, we're not following good far farming practices because they're only looking at how conventional farming is done. It's not that way anymore. With that being said, um, a lot of adjusters maybe have never worked an organic crop insurance claim before. So there might be a little bit of education that the farmer mm -hmm. even has to do in that situation or the agent or egg advisor, whoever it may be. So that's a little bit challenging there. Um, I will say that RMA is really actively working on this and trying to come up with better ways to serve the organic farmer with relay cropping being especially one of them. Uh, they are now offering crop insurance on relay cropped soybeans. And there's a map that covers the entire US on what states are eligible for crop insurance right away, or maybe what states you have to have two to three years of history on in order to get these crop insurance um, on those acres. And so that's a really great avenue for farmers to be able to get crop insurance on relay crop, which is also sometimes called interseeding. It's where um, you plant soybeans into a cereal grain and then you harvest the cereal grain and then later on you harvest the beans. So you kind of grow them separately, but you have them both planted at the same time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's really cool. Absolutely. And I think that's probably the biggest one is intercropping sort of the myth that you can't do it if you want to get crop insurance. Um, and thinking about the adjuster component of this of this conversation, how would you suggest folks learn how to how to help educate adjusters? Um, and, and what resources would you say have at the ready, um, either for your agent um, to, to share with your agent or to, um, to, to bone up when it comes time to possibly file a loss? Yes, I would start the conversation now. Um, most of those conversations I'm having with like claim supervisors who are like the bosses of the adjusters is happening now so that a farmer knows for sure that he's going to have insurance on those acres for the year. The worst thing in crop insurance is to have surprises during a claim where you don't get paid out. No farmer wants to go through that. And so it's always great to have those conversations up front. A lot of that will be between the farmer and the agent, and then the agent will submit information to the claim supervisor to see whether they will allow it or not. Then you know right off the bat whether it can be approved. And with that too, I should say that written agreements have a lot of different options to them. It is not just requesting crop insurance on acres that you can't have crop insurance readily available on. There's a whole different avenue for it too. So if you think that you should be able to get crop insurance on some sort, another type of relay cropping situation other than soybeans, there is options to go that avenue too. So a lot of things in crop insurance can be insured if you just do the legwork on it with some exceptions. Like I have a farmer that plants dry peas and then he wants to plant the corn into the dry peas and that one is not allowed. He has the peas kind of throughout the entire growing season, harvests the corn and then grazes the peas after harvest. Mm -hmm. um, and that one is not allowed. But a lot of times you can get insurance on these acres, which I think is not very common knowledge to a lot of farmers. So it, it really helps to just start the conversation early with a crop insurance agent can I have crop insurance on this? Do it the right way. Don't say like, oh, it was just a volunteer crop. You want to have that conversation up front so that everything is straightforward. Right. So communication is key. Be really transparent about what you want to do and possibly adjust back uh, if something is possibly not allowed. Um, what have been some pitfalls you've seen? I think that example of the peas and the corn is one. Um, some pitfalls you've seen producers 
uh, execute in the field that has resulted in uh, heartache when it comes time to file a loss? Yes, I, I know of a farmer in Nebraska that had chicken litter delivered to the side of his field and he was going to spread it throughout the entire field and then it was too wet. Uh, and this is kind of a one-off scenario. I don't expect this to happen very often, but the field was too wet so he wasn't able to spread the manure out throughout the entire field. So what they did when they did the adjustment process, and he had a terrible loss because there was no you know, fertilizer, whatever down. Um, they took the yield that was close by that chicken litter that had already kind of seeped into the ground and spread that yield across the entire field. So where in areas he had maybe five bushel corn, close to the pile of chicken litter, he had 180 bushels. So instead of giving him the credit for the five bushels that he actually harvested, they took the 180 and spread it across the entire field and he did not qualify for a loss. So that's yeah, uh, yeah. Um, kind of on a whole other topic of like the certification side of things. In the rules, it used to be that you had to have your organic certificate by acreage reporting deadline, which is July 15th, but they've allowed some leniency over the last couple of years on that where you just need to have proof that you've applied for certification. And mm -hmm. with that, if you're not able to submit your actual certificate by loss time, they will not pay your crops as certified organic claim. And so I know there's a group of farmers this year that weren't able to get their organic certificates in time for their loss. And so they weren't paid that claim as certified organic, even though all their paperwork was submitted timely, they're just kind of waiting on the certifier. So that's really tough too, because that's kind of out of their hands, but there is little things like that, that will come up. So kind of back to our point, communication is key, make sure everything's out on the table right away. I know we're big in crop insurance in Montana and I'm with the Montana Department of Ag organic program is my certifier. So they're keenly aware about crop insurance, but it's not as big around the rest of the country. So really putting on almost on your application that you need your inspection by July 15th um, and communicating that really early on with your certifier. Don't wait until July to apply because um, it's going to be a really tight turnaround and probably unlikely that they'll get it done. I, I really appreciate that. Yes, many, many a June spent running around inspecting farms that are new just to make sure we hit that reporting deadline. Um, Bob Whitney had a question for you. And Bob, do you want to just open your mic and go ahead and ask it and we can have a little conversation? Sure. I'm just curious, um, it, as an extension specialist, I work with a lot of different groups and a lot of different insurance agents, but who do you guys go to for answers? You know, who who is your source of information if you've got a question that's tough to tough to figure out? Yeah, good question. So I go to my approved insurance providers, underwriters. A lot of times they have maybe a specialized organic underwriter, and it might not be in that same area as where the crops are grown, but nationwide, they might have an organic specialist or maybe a whole farm revenue protection specialist, which is a whole another ball game. Um, but they often either, if they don't know the answer right away, they will go to the risk management agency, RMA, and figure out the answer and communicate it back. And so I probably more than like a conventional crop insurance agent has a lot more communication with the insurance provider and RMA just to make sure everything's out on the table right away because there are so many different options in organic farming and so many different things that can come up. Uh, so but, a lot of times that's communication right off the bat with the insurance company. Nate, if you don't mind a follow up with that. No, uh, please go ahead. The in, in Texas, we most of the farmers are conventional and organic. And mm -hmm. there is a lot of uh, disagreements between insurance companies over what so you got one farmer that gets paid and another one doesn't and so what would that farmer do if he thinks he's been unfairly treated by his insurance company is is there some sort of appeal process or something beyond that insurance company compared to other insurance companies paying off something yeah, there is a process, and I think a lot of it starts with the agent, um, have the agent go to advocate for that farmer. A lot of times what I personally have done in the past is if I work with four different insurance providers, there's, I think, 12 available nationwide, and I work with the kind of the top four of them. If one company denies it, and I don't understand why, or I don't think that's right, then I call a different one to see what their stance is on it. Um, just to make sure that we're all understanding the same thing correctly. And so if that's the case, you might be able to get some sort of change through there be 
before having to go to like a mitigation process type of thing, if that answers your question. It does, thank you. Yeah, Great absolutely. Question. Um, Julia, uh, one, uh, you had a question about um, the, the fact that organic certificates do not expire. Um, in this instance, we're mostly talking about new to organic folks. Um, but the if I understand you right, Megan, we need that organic certificate to have been applied for the crops that are going to be requested to be insured. So if I'm an organic producer wanting insurance on my wheat, but I only grew peas and flax last year, I need to make sure that I've been inspected for wheat and it lands in my OSP and on my certificate. Is that correct? Absolutely. You got All it. All right. Anything to follow up on that, Julia? Yeah, forgive me. I'm outside. Can you hear me? Sure. You're loud and clear. Please go ahead. Okay, good deal. Um, so I'm just wondering if you all think there's any opportunity down the road for that to be edited, given sort of the fluid nature of the certification process, and mm -hmm. also given the, the certification timelines don't line up particularly well with the RMA timelines. So I'm talking like interagency collaboration, which I know is rare. I know. I, it's one that I think that there's a lot of, if the community, in my experience, and I'll, I'll pass off to Megan in, in a minute, in my experience, the more energy we give to this, the more uh, folks are going to be paying attention. And so I think we have, you know, a few talking points when it comes to advocating in the farm bill. And I think that there is so much weight we could be throwing behind this topic around um, crop insurance and reporting and how it interacts with organic. And I think oftentimes we put a lot of effort into the um, uh, organic cost share. And that's a check of 500 bucks. These are checks of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so I think we're thinking about how to bring and make whole organic farmers. Um, organic crop insurance is where it's at, making sure that we can spread that risk and, and mitigate that risk for crop insurance um, is, is something that's going to be really big. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity to be discussing throughout the next few months in the Farm Bill as we advocate on the Hill, how we want to make sure that our, that this very issue is, is uh, considered, but also how we can educate everybody about clarifying it. Just like Megan said, um, as long as you've applied for organic certification, they're going to be able to give you some consideration for covering those organic crops, but making sure that everyone knows that, everyone knows their eligibility would be a huge opportunity, I think, for advocacy groups like OFA or education groups like, um, like OATS to try to get the, the facts out there. Yeah, I agree. And I'm I'm all on board. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm behind it. Um, if we can make change happen, absolutely. I'd love to be part of it. Super. Thank you for that question, Julia. And folks, um, if you came in late to the call, please jump in with any of your questions. As we are exactly one month away from uh uh, sign up for crop insurance. We want to make sure you have the tools to talk about it with your producers. Um, so Hi. let's see. Hey, oh, yeah. Leah, do you hear me? Leah, please go ahead. Yeah. Do you, uh, can you touch on the transition phase and in crop insurance? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, transitional crop insur insurance is kind of tricky or maybe not great, I guess. I, I typically call it a double whammy. And what I mean by that is farmers, when they're just starting to transition and they don't have any transition history, they are insuring as transitional organic. And so what that means is they get the organic county T yield. So as we covered earlier is 65% of the county um, conventional yield. And then they're also getting the conventional price. So they're taking a hit on the yield by taking a really low 65% of the county T yield price and that or yield, and then also taking the conventional price. So their crop insurance coverage is pretty low for that time period. And so with the whole exception where as long as you've applied for certification on the third year in order to receive certified organic crop insurance, a lot of times now we are seeing that farmers only have to ensure their acres as transitional organic for two years rather than the full three that it was maybe three years ago. So that's a great advantage there that's maybe helping them out a little bit. There's also a guideline that states um, on the RMA website that in order to ensure your crops as transitional organic, you are supposed to have a transitional organic plan, systems plan in place. 
and I know a lot of farmers are not actually having an organic systems in place that's maybe approved by a certifier. And so it states in there, if you don't have a, and this is kind of like, I'm giving out some of my secret information here, but um, if you don't have that certified transitional organic systems plan in place, then you are able to ensure your crops as conventional. Now, a lot of times I've seen where at claim time, this can cause issues because on that third year, if you're certifying it as certified organic, but didn't show any history of transitional crop insurance, the adjuster might question it and say, well, why didn't you transition? How can you go straight from conventional to certified organic? So it'll raise some questions there. Um, and along with that, there is a little bit of risk of insuring your crops as conventional because as you're doing that, you are supposed to be following the conventional good farming practices. So if you have some sort of loss because maybe weeds took over the entire field and now you don't have any soybeans left to harvest at the end of the year, it is most likely not going to be an insurable cause of loss because that would not be considered a good farming practice under the conventional guidelines. Hope that answers your question. That is. Yeah, thank you. And so for the for the transitional cropping system plan, the certifier is the only uh, entity that's uh, allowed to give that officially, or could like we as Rodell like organic consultants provide with a transitional organic system plan that would work for that matter? That is my understanding of it, um, but but good question. Maybe I should be doing some more clarification on my side as well. Great question. I'm going to write that down. And we'll shoot, shoot an answer back to you on that, Leah. Really good question. As we look to this, this topic of transition, do you see, Megan, um, that, that we need a better understanding of um, how TOGA is going to affect that status of if we're going to have conventional and technically right now go right into organic, if we didn't have a relationship with a certifier over transition, do you see any changes coming um, to how that's going to be meted out in the future? I, good question. I don't know for sure. Cause right now TOGA is just going to be 2023. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's going to be a non-issue if they don't renew it in the new year or make it part of the farm bill. Um, good question. I don't know that I really have an answer on it. I think there's a lot of things up for discussion and maybe a lot of more policy they need to look at. Um, and just so everybody's aware, the crop insurance handbook is over 900 pages. So there's a lot of information already in there that like what I do is I try to read through it to try to figure out what's specific to organic, what are the advantages that they could have and that kind of thing. There's not a lot of information that's maybe easily available as far as organic crop insurance goes. So a lot of it is just digging in, researching and trying to figure out um, on your own. So great question. I hope so. Um, I think the conversation is open. Awesome. Yes. Um, again, folks, we're about a few minutes to the end here. If you have any questions for Megan, please jump in. This has been a really exciting conversation so far. Um, Megan, as we think about, um, again, this coming crop year, what would you say are the, um, the, the practices that are Rather, rather the the when we think about crop rotations and what folks want to be growing, are there anything with um, with organic practices that um, advisors can be discussing and sort of smoothing out this perception about organic crop insurance? Um, as folks like the Rodale Consulting Team and other advisors out there um, bring up the idea of crop insurance to organic producers, um, are there key points that you would say make sure to hit? Um, to both make sure we're wholly in the in the realm of facts about crop insurance, but also about the the opportunity, the organic opportunity with crop insurance. Yeah, great question. Um, and I think I've said this before. I think the main things to hit on are contract pricing and written agreements. But I think just opening that conversation as crop insurance is not the same as it used to be. It used to be where organic um, farmers didn't get organic crop insurance prices. It's just completely different. And organic crop insurance is a really great way to make sure that you're securing some sort of revenue on your operation. If you're going completely uninsured or maybe just have enough diversity that you don't think you need crop insurance, but some sort of disaster happens, like I live in an area where every now and then we get hail insurance in our area. If your entire operation gets hailed out and you don't have crop insurance in place, you're going to be having a hard time to 
pay your bills and keep farming in the future where crop insurance is there to kind of help you in all those kinds of situations. So crop insurance, just to be clear on this, protects you from any natural cause of loss. And so most of the time weather related or maybe wildlife, anything that's completely out of your control or anybody else's control. Um, so it's just a great avenue to make sure that you have that secured revenue. So I think just having the conversation, it's not the same as it used to be. Maybe just have an open conversation with an agent to see if it works for your operation. And I'm not here to say that every single person has to have crop insurance. Some farmers just feel like they don't need it or maybe they have enough um, diversity that they really don't need it and that's okay. Or maybe the crop insurance numbers don't fit for their operation. That is totally fine. I just feel like it's really important that everybody is aware of the options available to them and that it can be an option for them. Love that. Yes. I think just education and getting the word out about how different it is from even when I first got certified in 2008. It is a different landscape out there today with a lot of good work done in several farm bills now to make it more accessible. Um, Bob has a has a question for you, and that would just be um, if you're available to help uh, train folks on crop insurance. And, um, and I will make sure everyone gets Megan's contact info. Um, so you can ask those questions directly and see if there's some opportunities to collaborate. Like we said, Oats is going to be having a bunch of programming coming out that hopefully specifically addresses this education question. How do we get the facts out there and the nuance that is the organic uh, organic insurance proposition? As we close out, I just can't thank you enough, Megan. This has been a really exciting conversation. And I think when we look to the potential of top, look to getting more farmers in organic and look to grow that organic farmland from 1% of American acres to hopefully 10, 20, 50% of American acres, it seems like risk and managing that risk is going to be a really important component to that discussion. So really love that you're out there advocating and uh, and providing really solid facts for everybody. Um, and Harriet was also asking, yes, uh, Harriet, we will send out Megan's info to everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, any any closing thoughts from you? Otherwise, really appreciate your time today. Yeah, um, I would say thank you as well. This has been really great. I love just getting the information out there. Um, back to Bob's question, I think those webinars will be a really great resource that we have coming up next month to kind of get more information. Um, always educating. So that's first and foremost what I do. So I think those will be really great to try to spread the information very briefly before that March 15th deadline. So maybe it's fresh in every farmer's mind as they're making those final decisions. Yes, absolutely. Um, so folks, we're going to be having another round of conversations on the Organic Advisor List Call series um, on that special deadline of March 15th. So we're going to be talking about how companies are looking to um, source organic ingredients and looking towards that end product and buyer. Um, so we hope you'll join us. Thank you again so much, Megan, for being here today and, uh, and lots of good stuff to come. So thanks, everybody, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you. All right, take care.